It must have an impact. It must have a purpose. Uh, and this, this purpose can only be the one to make our future better, to make it worth living on this planet. And for this, we need not only to develop vaccines against COVID, we need vaccines also for the planet. Our planet is sick. We need to develop these vaccines. And here innovation comes in. Here innovation must have an impact, must develop the solutions to cure the planet and avoid breaking of planetary boundaries. Dr. Roland Strauss is my guest on this special episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Roland is one of the most influential figures within the European innovation landscape. For well over a decade, in his role as managing director of the nonprofit Knowledge for Innovation, he has been the driving force behind the European Innovation Summit held annually in the European Parliament, which brings European commissioners and MEPs face-to-face -face with the needs of the companies, organizations, ideas, and startups driving innovation across the continent. Now, as Europe begins laying out its plan for delivering on its vision to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050, it is the role of innovation that will again take center stage. As the key innovation platform at the heart of the European institutions with the support of dozen MEPs, it is the K4I form in the European Parliament sitting at the crossroads between politics, business, startups, academia, and wider society, which is perfectly placed to help define the leading role it will play in, in achieving this net zero future. Right now, Dr. Strauss and K4I are doing that most notably by leading the charge for the development of a European innovation area, a single ecosystem for innovation across the continent that can harness the collective power of progress to achieve a just transition towards a sustainable Europe that truly works for all. The journey towards achieving this ecosystem is well underway. Uh, Roland has been working on it for a long time, but the inaugural European Innovation Area Summit led by K4I is set to take place in the European Parliament next month. So this is the perfect time to welcome Roland and discover more about this European innovation area and its first ever live summit in the Parliament. Welcome, Roland. It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Mark. I'm so glad you can make it. I really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak to me. You've been doing this for a long time, kind of leading the innovation front in the parliament and on the continent uh, to, to make sure that we're on the right side of history. My, my first question is, how have you weathered the storm? How have you weathered the pandemic, the, the Ukraine war, the crazy presidencies, all the things going on in the world um, to get you to this point in time? How have you been? Yeah, it has been not easy times because having not been able to meet in the European Parliament physically with our members of the European Parliament, with our stakeholders, with our innovation community uh, was quite uh, a tough time. Um, only a few days ago for the first time, we were able to go back to the Parliament and meet some of our members, our political members, which are members of the European Parliament, physically in the European Parliament, and we are we are ready to to start over, uh, but not just as a continuation, but uh, as in in a new setting with a new approach, uh, with a new innovation agenda, uh, which uh, we call the European Innovation Area. So we. 
decided to not organize the 13th European Innovation Summit, but the first European Innovation Area Summit. I love that. I, I think it's great. So, I mean, you, you obviously with the 13th, you've been doing this for quite some time, over a decade. And um, I really want to know, for those of us who are naive or, or don't know a lot, uh, who are listening about innovation and why it's necessary, why do we need innovation? Why, why, why are we having these summits? Why are we bringing this onto the continent to talk about? What, why is that important? Well, the, the European Innovation Area in Initiative is about strengthening innovation ecosystems at the local, regional and national levels and better connecting them uh, across Europe. We are aiming at a kind of single market for innovation because there are still quite some fragmentations in, in different uh, important uh, areas. Um, Innovation and technological leadership is the only way for the EU to maintain a strong, sustainable and competitive uh, e economy. That China would one day assume technological leadership in key industries was considered inconceivable some years ago. Now it has become a reality. We must by all means strengthen Europe's innovation capacity. And this is why we need a new innovation agenda for, for Europe. Uh, there are some obvious reasons why Europe needs to improve its innovation performance. We still have a lack of entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, we have a lack of later stage venture capital uh, to avoid also that fast growing startups go elsewhere outside Europe. Uh, we still have far too many regulations, especially for emerging technologies. And we have too little investments in women led venture capital funds and startups to name just a few. Uh, the eight focus areas, as described in, in the European Innovation Area Manifesto, uh, provide a good overview and summary of uh, the objectives that we have set for uh, innovation uh, in Europe in the future. So the, uh, I'm glad you, you brought that up. So the, if, if people go to the European Innovation Area EU, that's the website, they can find out about the summit there. Um, it, it will be the 27th to the 30th of June this year in, in Brussels and online. So it's kind of a hybrid event as well, so that uh, it'll be available for, for, for many people. I'm, I'm glad that you, you tickled on, on the manifesto on that, but I wanna break it down even further for the daily uh, citizen or our, um, within the European Union, uh, why, why is this innovation important? Why, why, why do we need innovation? Why are we talking about this? Is this, uh, 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 help us understand, is it a new delivery app or, or what, what kind of innovations are you talking about? What, what are the discussions heading there and why do we need them? Help us understand that a little bit better. In the beginning of the K4I Knowledge for Innovation um, activities in the European Parliament, our objective was to make innovation the top uh, priority uh, for, for Europe. Um, this has been at least partly achieved. We now have a dedicated uh, pillar in, in Europe's flagship uh, program uh, for research and innovation, uh, Horizon Europe. So it's innovative Europe. Uh, it's, um, it, it, it is a, a new approach and a very, well, risky approach, uh, especially uh, considering that governments uh, start investing in, in startups and even providing uh, equity uh, capital. So a lot has has been achieved, I think, over the past uh, few years, and we made quite some some progress on the way from research to innovation. There was some for some people, it was a bit confusing to see what 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 is research, what is innovation, what what should we do, where should be the focus, because we have 
a European research area. We even have a European uh, education area, but now is the time to have a European uh, innovation area, and we can all agree of that. And innovation must have a new uh, a new task plays a new role. It must be. It must have an impact. It must have a purpose, uh, and. This, this purpose can only be the one to make our future better, to make it worth living on this planet. And for this, we need not only to develop vaccines against COVID, we need vaccines also for the planet. Our planet is sick. We need to develop these vaccines. And here, innovation comes in. Here, innovation must have an impact, must develop the solutions to cure the planet and avoid breaking of planetary boundaries. So in this sense, innovation has become a much more clear and precise role and a clear purpose. Uh, and this is what we want to focus on in the future. I love that. And so uh, I'm sorry, I was leading you a little bit with the questioning, but uh, I knew that it would come out. So I know that knowledge uh, for innovation for a while has really been uh, talking about innovations for purpose, impact innovations for purpose that solve human suffering, our global grand challenges, and provide solutions to a better operating system for our earth, a better model to do things. I've been in, in the in innovation space for a while and, and, uh, meeting the new pioneers and the startups, bringing out new technologies and, and uh, in many different areas. And so I, I, I get this a lot. And I also see those uh, innovations that kind of fizzle out and they don't bring much because they're not transformative. And um, I like the fact that now we're presenting at the EU in a parliament area that innovations that truly can help us get on the right side of history and that are transformative. And uh, I see a lot, a lot of the time is that we have this change or project mindset when it comes to innovations or, or moving um, into the transformations needed in, in the future. For those listening who are innovators and pioneers and startups, it's really interesting uh, for and important to know that you can, if I'm right, and I want you to tell me this, Roland, you can still submit your idea, your action plan to contribute to this uh, transformation and to the program to be present possibly some things. Am I correct? Has that door uh, is still open? Sure, it's widely open. It's widely open because each innovator each startup, everyone, citizens are invited to sign up the manifesto, the European Innovation Area Manifesto, and submit their ideas. It can be, we have seen full action plans by, by organizations such as the, the Universities of Applied Science Network in, in, in Europe that's, that submitted their uh, action plan for the European Innovation Area. We see uh, the European uh, Innovation, uh, the European Institute of Technology and Inno of Innovation and Technology, uh, the different um, in the different uh, verticals from raw materials to climate to uh, uh, energy, uh, food, uh, health. Uh, they they are all uh, contributing to renew our our innovation agenda and, and to move forward in addressing uh, the challenges that, that we are facing right now. But we must uh, take into consideration what, what these last 200 years of innovation uh, have, have done because we did it without really considering uh, what it would do to our environment, to the planet. Uh, and now, Certainly, we need innovations that not only uh, take into, con into consideration uh, the, the consequences of 
of uh, these innovations, but, but address very specifically the, the, the big um, challenges we, we are facing right now in terms of climate and, and environment. And so we, we invite all uh, innovators and stakeholders to sign the EIA manifesto. And by the way, those who sign will also get automatically an, an invitation to the first European Innovation Area Summit. Um, and and we, we want to, to discuss the ideas that we receive and, and put them together uh, and discuss them with the policymakers and uh, uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel uh, and our political members, um, the KPI Forum, which is led by uh, Mrs. Uh, Carvalho, who is a Portuguese uh, MEP, who is very supportive together with, with many other M M MEPs. Uh, and well, all together, we want to take these ideas, these actions, and see how we can, in a meaningful way and in, in an impactful way, uh, draw the right policy framework, the right regulatory and le legislative uh, framework so that these innovations can also uh, um, unfold and, 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 and have the, imp the impact that, uh, that is intended. You're, you're really lucky and fortunate to have uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel uh, on board. She is fabulous, a super representative, and so I'm glad to, to hear that. Um, I, you know, in the past, I've dealt and, and heard heard horror stories about how difficult it is to to work with the EU and the Parliament. Is there any innovations or things in, uh, that have kind of made innovations and working in, in the systems of that bureaucratic uh, uh, spectrum of submitting forms to get grants and fundings and support for new pioneers and innovators coming into the arena. Has that been made any easier or through this, this process of, of the summit, do you have tools and helps and, and things that um, make it available for those on the ground, bottom up pioneers and innovators to, to kind of get into that ecosystem to, to offer some solutions? Well, thank you, Mark, especially for, for this question, because one of the, the purpose of, of the European Innovation Area is uh, to, um, to, to foster innovation cohesion, to bring the innovators from all corners of Europe uh, in and also use the, the opportunities that are provided by a big number of programs uh, at, at, the, at the EU and, and national levels, um, and especially now the, the recovery uh, fund, which is uh, almost as big as, as the whole EU budget. So for the next two, three years, we have uh, 750 billion euro extra uh, that can be spent and should be spent, uh, not only to recover, but to build this next generation EU, this next generation innovations. And for this, we, we must make and make a, a big efforts to, to widen the participation uh, in what the EU does uh, and, and, and go beyond the usual suspects that, that are that are that know how how to get involved, that know how to to write a proposal, but uh, now is the time to, to to get everybody on board and and mobilize uh, everybody. And we have we have the means. Um, it's big money uh, that has been made available, and we are planning to launch also at the summit um, the next generation. Innovation Forum, where we invite member states to uh, support with this budget, this extra budget that they get to support the innovators in their countries uh, to contribute to, to, to develop these impact innovations and, and be part of this next generation uh, movement that uh, we, we need and, and that that is a, a, great, um, a great opportunity for all of us 
to to turn the page and uh, and come closer together. Um, and next generation for me, it means it means a lot. It's not only younger people, but it's also rethinking how we work, how we live, how we consume. Uh, it's a kind of next generation world. I love it. I absolutely love it. That that's that, that's very uh, hopeful and optimistic outlook. That that it's the point of entry is a lot easier, and that um, uh, it's really has some momentum of what's possible and available. Um, you, you're primed in, in a wonderful position with the EU and and Brussels and what's going on, and that this event can happen there. There is another innovator, uh, Dr. Bertrand Picard with 1000 Solutions. I don't know how well you know him, but he just um, last year broke the, the record in, in uh, 2021 to go over his 1000 Solutions. He's actually received more than 1000 Innovations and Solutions. And his a seal of approval or requirement on that is that they're not just innovations for purpose, but that they meet the, the three-tier model of um, people, planet, and profit. So the triple bottom line, which, which he recalled, by the way, that the profit part of it is from day one, a viable business model. And so I, I want to hear from you just like Bertrand Picard and Thousand Solutions, are you also feeling that resonance that there's more innovators, more pioneers with solutions that are using the right models for success, for impact, for, for these innovations, for purpose or in on the continent um, that are submitting and, and out there? Or is, is it still at a phase where it's hard to find the right innovators to join? Well, I, I'm glad that you mentioned Bertrand Picard because we we met for lunch in Paris a, a couple of years ago, and then I invited him to come to the European Parliament in in, in Brussels, uh, and he was uh, our well keynote speaker uh, for what we call the EU Top 50 Startups uh, Competition, which we organized in the Holy Hall of the European Parliament, meaning the, the hemicycle of the European Parliament. I think it was a unique, uh, a unique event, never ever around the world. Um, we have seen a start a pitching event in the plenary hall of, of a parliament. So Bertrand Picard was there and, uh, and, and uh, it was very, gave a very um, uh, inspiring um, speech. Uh, prior to that, we, we met at COP21 in Bonn. I, I remember when he, he launched uh, his initiative for the 100 uh, solutions. And well, now it's time to, to liaise back and, uh, and see how we can further uh, perceive, pursue our, our common goals. And um, for this, I have planned uh, a new initiative, which is less a think tank and a debating uh, organization, but more a, a do tank. Uh, the working title is uh, A Light for Future. And there we want uh, not only to, uh, to have the policy support, but also get uh, all kinds of support for the, the innovators to develop the, these new uh, technologies and in particular um, the needed capital and, and investment. And for this, we, we, we will set up uh, a fund um, that is, will be dedicated to those uh, new technologies and innovations that fulfill uh, very strict um, um, sustainability uh, criteria. Um, but for sure, and I remember, I think I remember um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, yeah, having having explained because everybody said, well, this uh, this green economy we will not be competitive. It will not 
strengthen our economy, it will cost us a lot of money, and so on. And he explained when, when he was a governor in, in California uh, and that the contrary, the contrary was, was the case. I mean, certainly the um, maximization of profit goal as we have been, as we do so far, cannot at least be the only objective uh, that, we, that we pursue. Uh, we, we must have these uh, sustainability uh, objectives, but one does not exclude the other. I think the future green industries will uh, be economically and, and from a, an employment perspective and, and uh, um, a competitiveness uh, um, perspective be uh, the ones to go for. All those that will not enshrine the, the ESG uh, uh, goals and, and sustainability goals in their business model, they will be out in a few years. So the new uh, way to work can only go in this direction. It, it, it's absolutely true that it will go in that direction. And we've seen it time and time again, especially during this last two and a half years or, or, or more, of really economic downturn, pandemic, and many other issues going on in the world, we've seen that the sustainable models for organizations and business and for life uh, that envelop SDGs, the ESG, the, the taxonomies that just came out from the EU um, are more resilient. They're, it's, a, it's a better model and we're also seeing a lot of organizations and companies come out with planetary services as a core of their model for business. And these are innovations um, uh, like companies like Climeworks. And uh, we just saw uh, regenerative regeneration venture capital come out with Leonardo DiCaprio and, and um, Cradle to Cradle founder Bill McDonough and, and many others that are switching to this regenerative economic principle or this regenerative model for doing uh, business, kind of this planetary services, innovations for purpose that matter, that help transform and reach those transformations. So I'm really loving that. And, and we're seeing that it's a better, better model. Uh, they outperform their conventional counterparts. I mean, just... Uh, uh, Boylan Slate, the, the Ocean Cleanup Project, and, and uh, Climeworks, and that capturing carbon through um, direct air capture and things like that. These are innovations that we need hundreds of thousands of to start making a dent in the problems that, that we have, but that they're just a better model because there's this, there's this unique... Um, equation that most, most mathematicians would probably disagree, but when you put it in the biological or life or environmental context, one plus one rarely equals two when you're talking about earth systems, when you're talking about biological systems, when you're talking about services for the planet or just using a better model for life, those are exponential numbers. And so if you involve those in, into your, your business model or into your innovation, um, that's where the, tr the, the true growth is. I, I, I made a controversial statement. I was speaking to uh, Deloitte, 3,000 3, consultants from Deloitte here in Hamburg at the Congress Hall. And I, I made a statement. I said, the next green entrepreneur, the, the, the next trillionaire, will be a green entrepreneur. And what I meant by that is not because of the capitalism or the, the money. If you solve a million people's problems, you're a millionaire. If you solve a billion people's problems, you're a billionaire. And we have a lot of problems. We have a lot of issues that will get us, that, that need transformation. And we know some big monies are out there. And so it wasn't really about the wealth or the capitalism aspect of it, but it was about offering these services as just an exponentially better model. And that's why I think we, we will see some um, 
green entrepreneurs out there that are doing extremely well. And their model has nothing to do with selling a product. It has to do with leaving the planet better than we found it. And that's kind of what I like. Uh, and I, I see out of this European innovation area. Uh, can you tell me what stage is it at right now? And is there anything that we're missing on besides the manifesto and kind of what you're going forward that we've missed so far about what to expect and what it'll look like and how it will evolve? Well, we are very much looking forward to uh, the upcoming European Commission communication by, by Commissioner Gabriel, uh, which is very much in line with the European uh, innovation area. And well, the working title at least is Europe's uh, future innovation agenda. And, and we, we hope that, that this, this policy framework and uh, will also um, give uh, an extra impetus to, to the efforts made by, by the innovators and will make it easier uh, to innovate and, and will uh, provide for uh, an environment uh, that is uh, uh, encouraging this, this um, green transition uh, that we uh, are um, focusing or aiming at. So that brings me to a big statement of what the aim is on the European Union level or Commission level. President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, if I'm saying her name right, uh, said that the goal for Europe is to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Um, I, I, I tend to roll my eyes a little bit, but I want to take it very seriously. Um, how is the EIA being designed to ensure innovation will play a big part in realizing this vision of neutrality by 2050 and in supporting those objectives um, like, the the, like those that are enshrined in the European Green Deal? Um, and, and, and I, I, I won't make any personal comments because I really wonder, do we need to be net uh, carbon neutral or uh, is that really the goal? Is that the right objective? I think the, the Green Deal is, is a great project. Um, but the difficulty with great projects is to, to make them happen. Um, we have seen, for example, the, uh, the discussions about the, the green financing, the, the taxonomy, and uh, the fight whether we would keep uh, gas and, and nuclear uh, um, as technologies in which we should continue to, to uh, invest. Um, now, with the with the war in, in, in Ukraine, um, we got so more many challenges and, and the risk is that we deviate a bit from, from our uh, objectives. And here uh, I see the role of, of our initiative of, of innovation to, to not, uh, uh, well, to, to, to not um, uh, water down uh, the the ambitions and and the needs uh, that we have. I just read this morning, by the way, um, that the most valuable company uh, now is again Aramco, uh, the oil company, and, and and they just passed by Apple a, a little a little bit. But it it shows how how the war and 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 this. Um, considerations or, or fears uh, about uh, energy are changing uh, the dynamics uh, um, in, 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 in all ways. So what we have to, to, uh, to do is to make sure that Europe stays on track with the, with the Green Deal objectives uh, and uh, does not, um, does not uh, um, slow down uh, because it's also a matter of urgency. Uh, we cannot wait endlessly to do what, what needs to be done. 
to to uh, uh, to save the planet. Um, um, so our our um, role in this sense is, is to make sure that uh, the Commission and the European Parliament uh, do not um, water down uh, any of these objectives and and um, and go ahead as planned. I, I uh, a couple couple things that I see there, and I mean this is personal. I'd love to uh, hear your opinion, but I don't also want to want to get too political. Uh, I think if we go carbon neutral, that means that we're flatlining, that we're dead. You know, we, we're carbon based beings. Our our growing food, we need carbon. Uh, we need to capture carbon and and uh, deal with it. So I, I think we need to get there. I think we should be like Paul Pullman in his book, Net Positive, and uh, uh, Andrew Winston have talked about that we should um, leave the planet better than we found it. We should actually capture carbon and we should uh, leave a positive impact on, on the way we do business. And um, so, I mean, that's that's one, one thing I think that when we're saying this net net zero or carbon neutral goal. Um, I think it's a, it's a rough target. The other one that kind of gets me is 2050. So that's 28 years from now. Don't you think uh, with um, your knowledge of innovations and how to make moonshots and use the exponential function that that goal of 2050 is a little bit too far out in the future. One, when those commissioners will no longer be around who are making those rules and the MEPs will no longer be around, isn't that a little bit too far in the future to, to be able to hold people's feet to the fire to really make some, some actions? And aren't we saying, hey, we really don't believe in innovation and the, in the exponential function of innovations um, that we can do it in a much shorter time. Well, I'm always a bit afraid of uh, human behaviors in the sense that as long as it does not really hurt, we do not feel the urgency. But, uh, but I think it has become very obvious uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, as of today that, that we have no time to lose, that we, that we need uh, to find uh, solutions, in particular, as you said, to to get out the carbon from the atmosphere, because we are very close to reaching the limit, or the point of, of of no return. So even if we achieve the Green Deal um, objectives, it, it might not be enough for the saturation of, of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to be kept within the limits that we need. So we need innovations to, to get the carbon out of, of, of the atmosphere. We need innovations and new technologies that avoid the melting of the glaciers and, and the rising of the oceans. So, and ideally we would find solutions uh, such as nuclear fission where, where we can uh, um, develop uh, energy uh, as much as we need in, in a clear, uh, in a clean way. So no time to lose uh, in the country. We have to accelerate our, our efforts uh, to find the solutions and, 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 and the innovations that allow us to, to, uh, to avoid uh, the breaking of the, of the planetary boundaries. The, the, the comment you made earlier where, where you just read an article about Aramico overtaking Apple and, and kind of being one of the, the new companies, uh, uh, just uh, two days ago, I read a new article as well from The Guardian that there's uh, the oil, coal, and fossil fuel industry is creating what we call climate bombs, basically by their doubling down and their daily actual daily and the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being invested daily in fossil fuels uh, is creating uh, these tipping points uh, of, of what the, I guess a, a new term that they're coming out, these climate bombs that are really work, a bet against our future. It's an investment and a bet against the negative future. So we're actually 
investing or putting money into something that we know has a negative outcome. There's no, there's no model out there in the world that shows fossil fuels as a long-term model uh, being good for our planet. And, and when you combine that with, with what you said uh, earlier as well about the Ukraine, um, if we were to take food as a commodity off of the table, which comes from the Ukraine, if we were to take uh, fossil fuels uh, uh, off the table uh, that are coming from Russia, then a lot of these problems with the, the war and, and issues that we're dealing with, they would be non-existent because there wouldn't, there would be other, I'm sure we could find other things to fight or, or complain or worry about, but those two negative uh, uh, things would really make this whole Ukraine war pretty non-existent or it wouldn't be a reason to, to um, go in that way, that craziness. That's my opinion. But um, I just really think that, that uh, we need innovations uh, for purpose that aren't based off of old technologies. I always say that you're not going to invent the new Tesla or the new uh, rocket ship with a horse and buggy, you've got to think of it in a different way. You know, uh, Einstein's problem theory is that we really need to come up with innovations and technologies that get us off of these problems that we have food as a commodity or off of fossil fuels or extractive economies. Um, and what core things or policies or pillars do you have built in for K4I, but also into the EIA and this summer that are kind of pushing or nudging those who are coming on board or the MEPs or the commissioners to really think not only multi-generational, but to think how do we implement these in, in an expedient time frame? To, to get us to where we need to be? That's a difficult one. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I think they are all aware and more than aware. So it's rather about making choices and having a good will uh, and uh, being interested in the future, being interested in the next generation. And I think if these attitudes are there, then uh, the urgency that everybody can, can, can feel uh, will make us do all the efforts possible uh, to to cope with the, the problems and find the solutions and and go all together in one direction. Because the good thing with the problems that we have is that they concern all of us, and it's 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 all our future, our all future. And and uh, this is why I still hope that uh, the necessary. Uh, efforts, investments, policy frameworks, uh, innovation developments, whatever is needed to, to get this, this, this green industrial revolution uh, going will, will be made. And if I would have the responsibility as a policy maker, I would not want one day uh, to admit that I have not done my job. That, that's great. And I, I love on, on the website of the EIA you know, Summit, um, uh, you have this and you've you mentioned it earlier in our conversation, the European Innovation Area Manifesto. One, I, I'd like you to tell us more about that, but you also said not only can we sign this manifesto, we can kind of help shape it by becoming a part of this this process and um, to make sure that we hold the parliament's feet to the fire to make sure we are getting and going where we want to go. Can you tell us more about the manifesto and, and what it is? And um, I, I hear that it's really that boundaries, that guide, 
guideline to keep us on the right path to where we want to go. Yeah, I mean, there are eight focus areas. Um, They're all described uh, on the website and signatories are invited to uh, come up with, with ideas in each of the focus areas. They can do it online directly from their desk, from their computer. Uh, and uh, it, we collect all the, the inputs and we'll, uh, we'll find ways to, to submit it and discuss it with the, with the policymakers. So it's an opportunity for each and, and everyone uh, to come up with ideas, to propose uh, solutions, uh, and to be part uh, of uh, this next generation innovation uh, in Europe. I love it. And I love that it's a participant, just like the SDGs, just like the uh, um, Millennium Development Goals, that was a project everyone is something that people in advance could participate in that's for everyone. And so I love that uh, people who want to contribute to help uh, shape the future and shape the, the innovations really can participate in that. Um, how important of a moment do you think this summit uh, will be in the journey towards uh, achieving a vibrant uh, European innovation area? Well, for me, it, it could not come at a better time because the time is now. And now we have to take the right uh, decisions. Now we can fortunately meet each other again uh, personally um, and uh, look into each other's eyes when we agree on something and when we promise something and when we uh, propose some actions. Um, I think it's different uh, if you are face to face with, uh, with people and, and can look into each other's eyes. So I'm very much looking forward to, to this uh, event after two and a half years of, of absence in the European Parliament. And I think it's the right time. It's also the time of the new uh, Commission Innovation uh, Agenda and uh, Commissioner Gabriel will certainly uh, take the opportunity and, and, and speak about it uh, and also engage into discussions. So we also plan uh, to take some of the ideas and actions proposed to be uh, presented at the summit and, uh, and ask the commissioner uh, for one or the other idea, what she's thinking about it and, and have a real dialogue um, between the stakeholders and, and the policymakers um, at this occasion. One of the main themes of the summit is really about the critical impact innovations um, and how they will play in creating a sustainable future. Can you tell us a little bit more about this and what, what you, what you see as how they create this more sustainable future? Well, sustainability is now used by, by everybody. And for all kinds of purposes, I would, even, I would even say, but while we want to make sure that these in innovations and, and their, their purpose uh, respect clear and strict uh, um, criteria uh, that and address uh, in a very straightforward and clear way uh, the, the, the problems and result in a, in a measurable impact. So this is what, what I would understand uh, about this. It's not just nice to have innovations, but innovations that that make a change and and are you using a, a similar measurement tool or so kind of like bertrand picard's thousand solutions or do you have some some things already in place that quantify that is it the triple bottom line is it other other tools that the eu uses to kind of measure that impact and the sustainability aspect of those innovations that for purpose well we're not yet there, but we, we uh, certainly um, consider 
uh, existing uh, tools and, and uh, approaches such as the Sustainable Development Goals or ESG uh, criteria. Um, but what we want to do is, is to be very specific when it comes to the problem we address and the solutions that can have an impact. So also, and in particular, when it comes to, to financing these, these innovators and these innovations, uh, the, these criteria will and must apply uh, very strictly, um, maybe more strictly than what we understand um, by, by green finance, uh, well, in the everyday uh, uh, discussions. Um, that's that's interesting that you, that you you say that. So I mean, we know for this to reach the sustainable development goals, had we started in in 2015, would it would have needed about 90 trillion U.S. dollars to to make that achievement of sustainable development by 2030. Um, at COP 26 on the in the first week on Thursday in in um, Glasgow. Basically, Mark Carney and uh, his uh, uh, in the ge general planary of the United Nations uh, committed to 130 trillion U.S. dollars that had nothing to do with the uh, uh, NDCs of the country delegations and the country parties. So it's basically all private uh, banks and fi green finance bonds and uh, private organizations that said they will step up to the plate with 130 trillion US dollars to make sure that we reach the sustainable development goals in the Paris Agreement. Um, now holding their feet to the fire to make sure those monies get dispersed and placed in the right place uh, by 2030 is a whole nother process that's still in debate and deliberation. Um, do you feel hopeful and optimistic because of statements like that? Or do you have uh, hope on the horizon? You, you mentioned large uh, dollar amounts or large money amounts for the EU, um, that there is enough money, that there is enough political will um, out there to, to, to reach our goals for the Green New Deal, for the SDGs? I would say money is probably not the biggest problem. We need to, to have this blended finance approach, but with the, with the recovery fund, if member states agree to jointly invest in this green uh, transition, we would have a startup capital, let's say from a couple of a couple hundred of, of billion uh, euros, which, which could easily trigger uh, private investment um, of amounts that you were just uh, mentioning that, that are needed to, to do this green transition. So we have the possibility, we have the money, um, we have the people, we will be able to develop the technologies needed, uh, but uh, well, there needs to be a political will and we have to give the freedom to, to the innovators uh, and, and support them to, to develop these new technologies uh, that, that can make the difference. I love that. This is the hardest question I have for you today. And it's really one I ask all my guests. It's what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not the EU, not knowledge for innovation, but for you, Roland, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? It must be equitable and it must be respectful, respectful from humans towards the planet, from humans to humans, and we must create a basis of, of trust where this uh, respect uh, of what we have been given is, is uh, realized and uh, that we have to give back what we got. 
So that's my understanding. I love that. How can individuals and organizations be part of the EIA summit? We've kind of tickled and talked about it. Uh, if you're meeting someone new on the street, they never heard about it. What's your advice? How can they be part of it? What do they need to do to be involved and, and get on board? Sorry, I can, I can only repeat it. It is by signing the EIA manifesto, uh, like this day, they are part of the, of the community. They are part of the, the innovation uh, area. And not only with a signature or a photo or a company logo, but they have the possibility to concretely contribute uh, and, and actively engage in our work. What have you experienced or learned in this, this journey that you've taken in the EU and the parliament in knowledge for innovation so far? What have you experienced or learned that you would have loved to know from the beginning, from the start? Well, that it's much more difficult than I thought in the beginning. <laughs> but uh, Europe is a complex animal. Um, it takes a lot of time to come to uh, to conclusions, to, to, to come to decide jointly, to agree jointly. And I'm wondering, and I was always wondering whether we have enough time to, to be able to continue with these complex uh, procedures uh, that we have. Now we have the Future of Europe conference that discusses how Europe uh, is functioning and um, and is addressing certain of these these bottlenecks that that makes it difficult for us to to move forward uh, as fast as we we would need and and I hope that that well there will also be a kind of next generation Europe that will be able to address the our problems in 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 a faster and 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 more direct uh, way uh, than, than it is the case now, because it takes too much time, oftentimes. I totally agree, I absolutely agree. Roland, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas and talking to us about the first European Innovation Area Summit. It's been an absolute sheer pleasure that's all the questions I have for you, unless there's really something we didn't get to discuss that you wanted to let us know about, about the, the, um, the summit on 27th to the 30th of June or anything that, uh, that we, for, we left out or forgot. Are there any other things on the horizon that we should know about, new policy pillars or anything else that you would like to say before I tell you goodbye? Well, it would be great to have you, um, the president of the current uh, EU Council presidency, uh, Manuel Macron and Ursula von der Leyen uh, with us at, at the summit. Uh, I, I know that you may be joining, but only through video because you are on, on, on travel, but I, I truly hope that, that we get uh, more people like you and, and, and more of the, decision makers uh, join our efforts and work with us. I'm very glad that we met again here uh, today, Mark, and uh, I hope to see you in the near future. Thank you so much, Roland. It's been a sheer pleasure. And I, I, I too would like that. I cannot wait until we can see each other again uh, very soon. I, I think it'll be a great time. And I, I want to talk about it and promote it as much as possible because I think it's a fabulous thing that's that you're doing and that's going on and it's much needed for the world to to get those transformations to make it to the future that we all want to live in thank you very much and have a wonderful day we'll talk to you very soon yeah thank you mark